Aw, wasn't that cute? Anyway, like we say in Thai, cute, cute. <laughs> Good morning, y'all. How are you doing? Good? Everybody have your coffee? Double shot espresso? Whatever you need, no foam on top? Because then that means you don't have as much coffee in the cup. We want all that coffee we can get. Can I get a big amen from Live the Life this morning? Okay. Wow, some of you are quiet. That's okay. We'll try to make you loud by the time you leave. And uh, now it's really an honor to be here. This is, um, I feel like I'm with family when I'm here. And, and um, I feel like I'm a part of this team. And, um, and it's so good to be a part of a team that has the heart that your pastors and your pastoral team have. So thank you for always making me feel so welcome and for everything you've deposited and sown into my life and, and in Thailand as well. So just thank you. Um, today is, of course, a, a special day coming right in this. Hmm? You like that? Looks like breathe conference here on the, on the thing. Okay, I'm done. Um, trying to find, I'm trying, I'm trying to find my groove. Can you tell? Um, what was that? Okay. So, uh, coming off of breathe, it's been a powerful, powerful week. And, um, you know, it just was like, okay, God, we need some energy for today and strength for today. And he did not disappoint. I mean, first service, the Holy Spirit just did some powerful things. And, um, uh, for me, breathe conference this year, um, God just spoke so deeply to me on uh, Thursday night, which uh, Dr. Dolly Thomas um, was the minister uh, for Thursday night, the speaker for the opening night, and it gave me the chance to just receive, and God knew I needed it. I needed what she had to say, and it deepened the work of the Holy Spirit in a, an area in my life, so I'm very thankful for that. And um, so, yeah, it doesn't matter what level of leadership or whatever that you carry, um, we always need the work of the Lord in our lives. It's a continuous thing. It's not a, 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 there's never a time where we cross the finish line and say, okay, I'm done. God's done. I'm good. No, that's probably my boyfriend. Just tell him I'll call him back. <laughs> Pick me up at seven. PM, not AM. Nene doesn't do mornings. Okay. Okay, I'm done. Okay. So turn to your Bibles to Joshua 7. Seems like the last few times I've been here, I've preached in Joshua, my favorite book probably in the Bible. And today I'm not going to preach the same message, but I'm going to preach from the same context. And I want to give you a little bit of background before we uh, really dive into some of the points that I have to share in the the main body of the message. So if you'll turn to Joshua 7, I'll kind of give you an overview and then we'll move forward from there into a couple of different scriptures. But first of all, I need to know if you're ready to really receive something from the Lord, right? Not just another sermon. I'm not the best sermon person in the world, but I'll tell you one thing. I, I can move out of the way for the Holy Spirit to move and um, I'd rather him show up than me say a bunch of stuff, right? Okay, so um, I want you to just take your hand, put it over your heart, if you're so inclined, and let's pray. Lord, I want you to just say this, Lord, I give you my heart. No, really, I give you my heart. Every hidden thing, everything that I buried, Everything that I've said, it doesn't matter. Everything that I've called dead. Everything I've called done. And I give it to you. I ask you to do a work in those places. Transform me today. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of today's message is The Divine Do-Over, The Divine Do-Over. And uh, I had some students in, uh, in Argentina, I, I would use the word divine and in Spanish, divino, you know, so I would be teaching or something and it's like, es un acto del Espíritu Santo, un acto 
divino. And they'd be like, they're always like, divino. They would make fun of me, right? I, was, I said, you know, there was a prophet in the Bible that some young people made fun of him. And they got torn apart by bears or something. So don't be making fun of me, all right? I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. So they'd be like, divino. And so I had to kind of stop it, stop using that for a while. But I've resurrected it again. And so there you go. That's free for you today. I'm giving you that awesome word. So divino, or divine rather, the, the divine do-over. What I'm really referring to when I use the word divine is sovereign. Orchestrated by heaven. It's a do-over that's orchestrated by heaven. Have you ever asked for a do-over? Have you ever wished for a do-over? Do you know what a do-over is? <laughs> Some of you are like, what is she saying? Not a sweep-over do-over with your hair, but a do-over to be able to go back and get it right. To be able to undo something or have another shot at it. Hello? The divine do-over. In Joshua 7, I'm going to paraphrase this rather than reading it all just to hopefully save time. And it's kind of hard because I am a storyteller. And so sometimes it works better just to read it verbatim. <laughs> That's shorter than me telling the story. But in Joshua 7, we see that this new generation of, of Israelites has actually entered into the promised land, whereas their parents' generation failed to enter into the promise because of disobedience. And how did they disobey? Well, obviously, they had done the hard work of marching all the way from Egypt, camping out in the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, they had done the work of getting through the sand, coming to literally the mouth of the promised land, the threshold, the doorway of entering into everything that they left Egypt for. So how was it that they disobeyed? Because you see, just a little bit of obedience doesn't equal obedience. Hello? Part obedience doesn't give you the benefits of full obedience. And so when we justify just a little bit of obedience, that can be a very dangerous thing. Because we can actually deceive ourselves into thinking we did obey, kinda, right? Kinda. But there is a blessing that comes when you fully do what God tells you to do, right? So this generation actually had entered in, whereas the parents' generation had failed from simply lack of belief. They believed the giants were the theme or the main thing and not the, what God had said. They looked at the enemy's power and said, that's greater than the word of the Lord over our life. <sighs> Ow, did that get you? Because I just stepped on my own toe. They believed that the giants threatening them had greater authority and say over their life and their future than what they heard from heaven. La palabra divina. Right? So here they are again, their children finally say, we're not doing that. We're sick of the sand. We're bored with manna. We want the things that God promised our forefathers. The whole reason we're out in this desert is to enter into someone somewhere else. Like this desert wasn't meant to live in. It was a highway that leads somewhere else. Okay. So they're there, they cross over. First thing they see is Jericho. Jericho is a massive city, fortified city with a proper army. So there's fighting men on the wall. They have weapons. All the children of Israel had was tambourines and trumpets. Now you can throw a trumpet and hurt someone, <laughs> but they did not have weapons, right? And so God said, march around the city. They marched around the city. They did exact, they obeyed almost everything that God told them to do. And a lot of them, they did their part, right? They marched around. Then on the seventh day, they marched around seven times when God said, commanded Joshua to blow the trumpet. They all blew their trumpets. I'm sure the women that had the tambourines went to town with the tambourines. Everybody shouted. Why? Because the shout, I want you to hear this good before we get to the ministry time today because it's important. The shout releases an amen, which means será, so be it. 
it releases this amen and so be it to what God has declared. And it comes, the shout can't come before God's timing. The shout has to come in God's timing at the appropriated time because there is a Kairos time of God that we can miss if we don't stay in the current of the spirit. Hello? So we see this because Jesus said he was on, on top of a hill and he looks at Jerusalem and he starts weeping. And he's like, you know, you're saying Jesus. I mean, the Bible does say Jesus wept, right? He started crying. And he said, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, if only you would have known what was, how does it go? The, what would have brought you peace? And he said, you missed your, oh, Jerusalem. You missed, saddest words in the Bible. You missed your day of visitation. You missed your day of visitation. Can you imagine being a part of the parents' generation in the desert and seeing the signs and the wonders that they saw? And getting to the place where they saw, many of them, in fact, none of them saw the giants. 12 people in their group saw the giants in the land when Moses sent them to spy out the land. So 12 people in a corporate crowd came back and literally by their words, stunted and destroyed the potential of an entire generation. This is why coming into the house of the Lord and hearing the word of God is so important because what you hear determines what you believe. What you hear and what you believe determines what you walk out and act out. Right? So <laughs> here it is. They're like, they're like, we're going to go on in. I'm, I'm going all around here. Sorry. I need more Dr. Pepper or something. And where was I at? Oh, yeah. So, uh, you missed your day of visitation. Their whole generation missed their day, their moment that God had pre-planned for them. Listen, if God tells you something and he speaks something over your life, he has predestined that to come to pass. It would, as my, as my dad would use this word when I was little, I didn't even know what it meant. Thought it had something to do with horses. He said it would behoove you, like a hoof, get it, hoof, horseshoe. It would behoove you to stop that right now. I was like, I don't know, but when you bring out the horse thing, I'm going to stop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It would behoove you to believe what God says. It would, it would, it would be in your best interest to plan your next step based on what the Lord said and not based on what you see. Here's the way we relinquish authority is when we hear something from the Lord, we've heard the word of God, but then we look at the enemy and we consider that his power is greater all of a sudden because he's in view. So what we see becomes more powerful than what we hear. And the Bible says that destroys faith. Why? Because faith doesn't come by seeing. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. Right? So faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by a word. If you're here seeking a word of prophecy today, can I encourage you? Stop chasing prophets and get a hold of the prophetic book. This thing is full of prophecy. It's full of prophecy. When we chase prophets for a word from the Lord, it's literally like trying to justify spiritual, can I go there? I'm just gonna drop a bomb on you. It's like spiritual card reading, spiritual palm reading. It's like saying, God, what you said in here isn't as powerful as what someone can read when, when, I, when I go to them and say, lay hands on me and pray over me, right? So 
Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, but then all of a sudden when we, when we see something, we give it more credibility than we give the word of God. And it is hard because you're hearing this and you get pumped up, but you're not seeing Jesus in a giant form over there behind the enemy going, I got this. <laughs> you're just seeing the giant, right? So these guys determine, I'm going to go in. They go in, they get Jericho, they march around, the walls fall, and they're like, ah, you know, they all go back to camp and they're camped out in this place called the Valley of Achor. And the Valley of Achor sits between Bethel, uh, a, a, a town called Bethel, which means house of God, and a town called Ai. Literally, it's the, the spelling's very difficult for Ai. Are you ready? It's spelled Ai. I know, right? very hard. Why couldn't that have been on my exams in school? I would have totally rocked that and made the honor roll or something. Anyway, AI is spelled A-I. All right. Thank you, Bible, for being simple. AI. And there's about two to three miles, two and a half miles between these two points. So in, an, in essence, these guys are sitting between the house of God, what they've heard, and this heap of ruins, what God said they would conquer and build upon and live on. Because AI literally translates heap of ruins. In fact, it, it, it comes from a Hebrew verb that means to bend or to twist to a point of destruction. So when God tells you, I'm going to give you dominion over that place. Are y'all tracking? When God says, I'm going to give you dominion over that place, this is a good picture of that. What he says is, I've visited that place already. Because the prophetic, if you want to know about it, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, the Bible says. So the spirit of prophecy has already gone out into chronological, you know, in Cairo's time, we're living in chronological time, what we can see, feel, touch here, has already gone out and visited that place and started twisting it for you. And they're bending it and they're weakening the strong man and it's getting it to the point where literally it's a heap of ruins. It's ripe for ruin. So they're sitting between these two points and they think, wow, so Joshua sends out a couple of guys and says, go look at AI and Bring back a report. Tell me what we need to do. So these guys come back, right? And they said, can y'all do that? <laughs> Girl, please. It's like, Joshua, please. All we need is like, just send up a couple of hundred men, a couple of thousand men. We're going to take the city. It was like 12,000 people there. And we're like, we're millions. You know, they're flexing their muscles after Jericho thing was God had told them about Jericho when you destroy it because it's the first city I want you to destroy it completely don't keep any of the goods nothing don't worry about any of that there's something symbolic about you've crossed over to a new level so the first devil you conquer I don't want you I want you to leave him as dust don't leave any of it standing no 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 cut it off all right so here they are they're thinking we did that and they're like, we're going on to AI. So he says, well, that sounds like a good plan. So he sends two or 3,000 people, men, up to AI, a city of 12,000. And when they got there, they're like, Roar. I don't know what they did. They threw a trumpet or something. I have no idea. But the people of AI came up, rose up, and came out after them and chased them out of the city and killed three dozen Israelites on the slopes on their way back to the valley of Achor. Now, the Valley of Achor translates into the Valley of Trouble. And there's a reason for that. It gets its name originally uh, from the incident that happened prior to the, the defeat at Ai. It was something that nobody knew about. But it, was, it would affect the future and it would affect the forward momentum corporately of this group of people. A man named Achan had taken something from Jericho and nobody knew it. 
When he was in Jericho, before they burned the city and they destroyed everything, he saw a Babylonian mantle. A mantle is like a cloak. It's like the thing that was passed from Elijah to Elisha that, that represented the anointing. It has the, the scent of the person before it. And theologians often say that when the mantle is passed from one person to another in biblical times, that literally the character of the, of the owner of the mantle would be transferred and the person receiving the mantle would take on the spirit, the characteristics of the person before. So understand today the importance and the, the demonic draw Come on, I'm preaching this. I don't know. There's somebody, at least one person. The demonic draw of why the mantle? And Achan took that thing up and some gold and silver. He hid it and look what he did. He went back to their camp in the valley where they were camped between the house of God and a heap of ruins. And he went into his tent, his dwelling place, the intimate place. I don't know about y'all, but usually when people come over to my house, they don't go into my bedroom. And I'm so thankful for that because my bedroom is my bedroom. You know what I'm saying? Like, you, uh, there might be stuff stacked two feet high on the floor next to the bed. You know, I mean, the rest of the house looks great, but my bedroom, it's an intimate place. Right? It's, 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 it's where I lay down and sleep. It's my safety place. It's my refuge. It's where I have thoughts that the Holy Spirit is, is thinking over me and speaking to me. And when I lay down and sleep, there could be dreams that happen. You see what I'm saying? And he took that Babylonian mantle, the spirit of the enemy. Here he was fresh into his promised land. There was no more stinking desert sand under his feet. Now there was a land flowing with milk and honey, and in the middle of a land of milk and honey, he takes the mantle of the enemy and he sows it like a seed in the earth in the middle of his tent. He digs a hole, he puts it in there, he covers it up, he stamps it out, and he's like, nobody will know. God knows about seeds. Wow. Wow. Achan sowed something of his enemy into his promised land. He took toxin and poisoned what God wanted to give him. This is what we call a self-defeatist attitude. Friends, there are some of you that God brought you here maybe years ago, maybe months ago, maybe weeks ago. And he did a, he's done a deep work in you in the past. And he weeded out things. Meth, it could be other drugs of addiction, alcohol, pornography, violence against your family members, um, just selfishness, pride, things like that. I mean, um, yeah, jealousy, um, being suspicious of people because you were raised in that environment. And so you come in the church and you start suddenly you start seeing with those suspicious eyes again. And then you start questioning in the holy place in a way that you used to do in unholy places. And so you're kind of taking a little bit of a mantle from the enemy and you're bringing it to your holy place and your holy land and you're burying it there and saying nobody will know. And when you do that, you're like, let me get this thing buried down. Mm, mm, mm. All right, we're good. And then all of a sudden, in an opportune time, God says, go up and make that heap of ruins the foundation for what I want to build in your life. And you're like, yes, Lord. And you run smack dab into the middle of a one thing, of a hidden thing. And then you wonder why you can't get over that and pass that so that you can get to what God promised you. Well, God told Joshua to tell the Israelites this. When he revealed that there was sin in the camp, he revealed what Achan had done. God said to tell him, tell the Israelites there's sin in the camp and they cannot stand. They will not be able to stand against their enemies 
until the hidden thing or the sin is removed. You can't get to point A, from point A to point B if there's a big old pole right in the way. So they discovered this and, and God tells them, as Joshua is saying, like, why, why? We got defeated at Ai and you promised, you said, this is our land. You said that you were gonna drive out all the ites before us and here we are and, and it's a heap of ruins. Come on, like we'd say in Argentina. What's going on? Like, why? Why is this still here? Like, why? Like, this is a little thing. Give me bustle. It's like, God says, this isn't rocket science. It's one thing that is yours, but you got to do that first. I, I want you to have that. That's where I intend for you to get to, but you can't get to there with this big old stumbling block in your way. You got you to remove that so you can run the race with strength, with surety, with a pure heart, with a holy heart and with holy hands. Right? And so God says, mm, remove it. And listen, when, when, when you suffer a defeat over and over in a certain area, but you know you've heard from God, you need to go back and say, Lord, why? Because nine times out of 10, God will say, well, this is the reason why. There's a reason behind it. There's something here that needs to be dealt with. And listen, if God exposes it to you, his intention is not to destroy you with it. His intention is not to judge you over it. God exposes it to dispose of it. God exposes it in order to dispose of it. He loves you enough to pull out the infected tooth so you don't get a blood infection and end up dying over such a small thing. So now I want you to kind of hear the rest of the story. In Joshua chapter eight, just the first few verses, then the Lord said to Joshua, this is after they took care of the sin, they took care of Achan for sure. Sadly, Achan, because of his choice, aborted any fruit from his life, was aborted that day. He aborted generations to come. He aborted his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and all the ones that God intended to bless and send throughout all the nations and all the earth. Then the Lord said to Joshua, don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. Wait, hold up. <laughs> God, I don't want to go back there. I don't want to face that thing again. Please. That was so hard. The defeat that I, that I experienced there was so hard that I can't bear it again if, I, if I'm defeated one more time. Yeah, but you're not the same person you were when you went there in the first round. And the timing has changed from the time you first went to, you went after it and the timing now. You're in a different season. You may not have known about seasons back then. You didn't know about processes back then. God had you on a process. Sometimes God will let us sense a defeat. Notice I didn't say suffer a defeat. You feel a defeat in a certain area that he sends you out against. Sometimes he lets us feel that so we understand our need for his empowerment. You can't even dig up the mantle with your own strength. He's got to enable you to do that. You know, you can't deliver you that thing. Like that. He says, no, I want you to go back. God, please, that was the most painful thing in my life. Please don't make me go back there. Don't make me relive that. God says, do you trust me? God, I'm too tired. Please don't make me, don't make me the father or the mother of many ministers and ministries. Please, I'm wiped out. I'm tired. I don't have the strength. No, no, no. You don't have the strength from the last season. This is a new season, and I give you new strength for new seasons, right? God doesn't like his name to suffer defeats. 
So I could turn this into an American, uh, very American, culturally appropriate message today by saying that he cares about your dreams and wants you to be all that and on a stick and dipped in chocolate. And he really, I don't think that's important to him. Chocolate, yes. Us on a stick with chocolate, maybe not. <laughs> just, I just interrupted myself, didn't I? Just then, so. I'm back, okay. But really, it's, it's about his name. Because if I go down, his name goes down. And that's why Joshua in chapter seven, he cries out to God. He's like, what in the world is happening? Why did we get defeated at Ai? What will you do, God, for your great name? And that's when God goes, um, yeah, can you just get up off the ground, Joshua? Because this is not rocket science. Like, there's not some enemy lurking around the corner. You just have something there that's making you stumble. So get that thing out and then run it, dude. Just run with all your might, right? So he says, I'm going to give you a divine do-over. I'm going to give you a do-over that's been orchestrated by heaven. I'm going to give you a do-over that's in the timing of God. I'm going to give you a do-over that's in the mind of God. I'm going to give you a do-over that's literally in the calendar of God. He says, I want you to go back there. And he says, for I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. What? After they just ran us out of town? Really? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. That way you can turn to look at the heap of ruins and say, I don't care if they ran me out yesterday. Today I've heard from heaven. And because of that, I have a faith that will run upon a troop and leap over a wall and take a pebble and fall a giant. Man, do you know that the phrase used there, I have delivered into your hands, translates as a legal document of divorce, the legal ending of a connection. Because see, there was a connection there. Why? Because the enemy had the right to run them out of that place because they had left a door open to the enemy. Because the enemy, the Bible clearly says, I've given you authority over all the, what? I've given you authority over all the, of the enemy. If that's true, how did the enemy have the power or authority, seeming authority to drive me back from the promise? The only time, I want you to get this good in your spirit, the only time the enemy will ever have authority to drive you somewhere, to drive you out, is when you've abdicated your authority. When you've not taken up your authority, it's there for the taking, friend, and the enemy will take it full on. So God says, I'm giving you this legal document declaring an end to the enemy's power over you. Go take the city. And you know what? They did. I know this may seem like a, a sidetrack to you, but I want you to turn over to 2 Kings. Chapter 13. So the story in Joshua that we just talked about and this story have one huge uh, theme uh, in common. And that theme is generational connectivity. So in Joshua, we see the, the generations and the consequences of the failure of one generation that's imposed on the next generation. And we, say the, we see the same thing playing out here in 2 Kings 13. 
And I'm just gonna kind of skim over the front of it so that you can see that generational connection. Now, these are kings here when it talks about the kings in this chapter. It's talking about the kings of Israel. In other words, the kings of the people of God, the kings who know better, the kings who know his name is Jehovah, Yahweh, I am that I am, the one that delivered out of Pharaoh, the one that delivered at the Red Sea, they know this, this God. And it says, in the 23rd year of Joash, son of Isaiah, uh, king of Judah, Jehoaz, son of Jehu, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord by following the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, and he did not turn away from them. Now, the, the sins of Jeroboam were uh, the sin was the sin of idolatry. And you can see later on it talks about they left the Asherah pole standing in Israel, right? So in other words, let's do this. Remember that mantle that, a that uh, Achan buried? Let's just call it, call it an Asherah pole from now on in the sermon. So there was something they left standing in Israel, even though they knew of God, and they obeyed almost completely. It was like 99.9%, .9%, but they still had that little percentage of disobedience. But God, we did everything else. Come on, give me a break. I know, Mom, I didn't clean out from under the bed, but everything else looks great. Why can't I just go to my friend's house now? Hello, anybody? Yeah. I remember my dad came over to my first little apartment that I had. It was a, time, it was a garage apartment literally above someone's garage. Had this carport over here, and yes, I'm interrupting my sermon to tell you a story. Had this carport, like when you came up the stairs, and the stair thing was kind of like, it was a little shady, you know, like, like that. And I don't think the garage had been opened in years, but I was living on top of it, you know. It's like 400 square feet. And I walked up the stairs, or he's walking up the stairs one day, and he comes and visits, you know, like shaking that thing. Carport's like a metal roof flat thing. Well just happened earlier that day I, I couldn't afford a toaster so I decided to make me some toast in the oven so I put the oven on broil and I put in a piece of bread with a lot of butter on it and I put it on broil and I thought it's not cooking fast enough maybe I should move that tray all the way up look I didn't never said I was Chef Ramsay okay and I took the tray out and I put it really high. The smoke alarm was going off, you know. I was like, oh no. I grab it, I pull it out of the oven. Like my piece of toast looked like, looked like a, a black iron weapon that could take out Goliath. And I have it on the spatula and I'm like, I don't know what to do. And it's smoking and it's making the alarm go off and I'm like, I don't know what to do with it. I didn't know my dad was coming that day. Why did he have to come that day? I don't know. But I opened the door and I did the only thing I knew how because I did think about putting it in the trash, but that's a rubber trash bag. And it will melt if I put this piece of iron carbonized weapon in there. And so I opened the door and I just flick it out on the carport because that old lady isn't going to come up here. She can't even climb stairs. I go down there to pay my rent. You know what I'm saying? So I just kind of flick it to the side and it's like stuck out. The birds wouldn't even come around it. They're like, ooh, mm -mm -mm. today's a great day for fasting. You know, I'm like, so my dad comes up and he goes, I as he knocks on the door, I'm like, oh shoot. You know, so I'm I'm I get busy cleaning up. Everybody do your air thing. Cleaning up, right? Let's do it one more time. Cleaning up, right? So he comes up the stairs and I hear him like wheezing outside. And I don't know if the smoke got to him or what. No, he's laughing. So I open the door and he goes, What's that? And I'm like, why do you have to notice everything? Like that's over there. The piece of toast, carbonized weapons over there. And he goes, did you try to make toast today? <laughs> I'm like, I hate you. Anyway, so he comes inside and I'm like, yeah, this is my new apartment. Ugh, ugly furniture, ugly carpet that was nasty. Like, it was, it was terrible. So he comes over in the kitchen. He's like, yeah, it's looking good. He opens the oven and discovers all my dirty dishes that I just stuffed in there when I, I'm like, how did you know? How did you, just, okay, that's all. Y'all didn't laugh at that. But anyway, so. Because what are you going to do when someone shows up unannounced and you have dirty dishes? 
you got to get rid of the evidence, so you shove it into the oven. You're welcome for that, all you first-time apartment people. Where was I? Now I've really done it in, haven't I? <laughs> Lisa's like, oh, no. So, like, you think, oh, I've done it. It's all clean when it's not really clean. It's all fixed up when it's not really fixed up. All you did was rearrange stuff. You didn't really obey. All you did was rearrange stuff you didn't really clean. All you did was move it from public and you stuck it under the bed so it could be in private and you didn't really get rid of it. And so then when you don't have the blessing, you can't figure out why. But see, God's not like your dad. He doesn't come in. Well, my dad's a little bit more talak. You know, he's like, he's very intelligent. So he knew to go to the oven. But, you know, God's not like a, a friend that'll come in and not notice there's dirty dishes in the oven. Right? God, God's like, look in that oven. I mean, it's the first thing he sees. He's kind of like my dad, I guess, then. You know? He's like, first of all, there's a really nasty piece of charred toast out there on top of the thing. And there's dirty dishes in the oven. Friends, we can't fool God. Man. So God's, God's got, uh, where am I? God's looking, we're looking through here in, in 2 Kings 13 and we're seeing that king after king after king keeps the Asherah pole in the middle of Israel. And then, we, but we see God's mercy because like in verse four, it says, then Jehoaz sought the Lord's favor. So he was one of the kings whose fathers and father's father and grandfather, great-grandfather, they had all kept the Asherah pole there. Well, he sought the Lord's favor, and so the God listened to him, the Bible says. But God couldn't bless him beyond the pole. So what does that tell us? That tells us God is so willing, and God wants to bless you. So when he exposes something, friend, it's not to keep you from something. It's to get you to something. It's not to rob you, it's to heap bountiful blessings on you that that thing prevents you from having. In fact, this thing is going to tell you, I'm God's best for your life. No, you're a liar. You're not. You're an imposter. That's what, that's the word. Y'all, I know I'm going off, but I'm telling you, there's a, there is one person that God is dealing with very strongly. I don't know if you're here or you're online, but God is telling you there is an imposter in your life. There's an imposter in your life. Don't settle for an imposter. So we get down here and all of a sudden we see that there's another king and Elisha, who's a prophet, the man of God, has been in generations of these kings' lives. And they never utilized him. They never looked to him. They never let him father them or speak the word of the Lord over them. And all of a sudden, one king comes in and he starts saying, oh, my father, my father, the horses and chariots of Israel. So he's actually using the words that Elisha used when he was begging uh, Elijah, his spiritual father, to inherit a double portion of his anointing in his mantle. When his mantle fell from his shoulders, Elisha picked it up and Elisha proved the anointing. Elisha called on the name of the Lord. And he used those words, oh, my father, my father, the horsemen and chariots of Israel. He was saying, here comes heaven to get you and to take you away from me. And so this king is basically coming as almost like an illegitimate child, a child that's never honored the father and on the deathbed says, can I have the inheritance? Friend, the church is acting like that today. We want the inheritance, but we don't want the relationship. And he uses all the right words, but he has no relationship whatsoever. But it's okay because fathers love beyond failure. And so Elisha rouses himself up off his deathbed because the guy showed up. At least he showed up. Hello? And so he says, take the bow and arrow. 
and point it to the east, open the window. He opens the window. The old prophet put his hands over the prophet of this impure, defiled king that was there to use him, right? And he put his hands over and he goes, shoot, shoot the arrow, like with urgency, friends. When you're here today and in a few minutes, when the Lord starts speaking something emphatically, don't hesitate. And so he fires off the arrow and when he does, it releases the prophetic and the prophet begins to speak. This is the arrow of the Lord's victory over your enemy. And the guy's like, oh, okay, cool. You just feel like, really? And then he says, take the arrows. Listen, I'm just going to help y'all. Listen, Linda, you're not listening to me. You've seen that video, haven't you? Is that hilarious? Linda, Linda, you're not listening to me, Linda. Okay. If you don't know, you don't know. Google it. Linda, Linda. He said, listen, I want to tell you something. Once the waters move, stay in the water. Don't get out and go, woo, wasn't that nice? Uh, are there still ripples? Get back in. Get in the water, right? So he says, pick up some arrows. He's like, okay. Picks up the arrows and he goes, now strike the ground. Now I want to tell you, I know we're in Texas and we don't have men that would do bink, bink, bink. But uh, that's the word I use for it. He says, strike the arrows. I'm looking for something to strike with. He gets something, plant, better not. Okay, so he gets something and he's just like, okay. He was not from Texas because you guys would be like, give me the arrows, right? He's like, he's like, Bang, 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 on the ground. That is a sissy arrow thingy that you just did. There's no Texan man that's going to do that. Get out of here, right? <laughs> Go to Gander Mountain right now. No, I'm kidding. Y'all don't even know. Okay. And he says, strike. And he does this half hearted little pound, little tap. It's not a pound, it's a tap of the arrows. Friend, if the Lord starts speaking to you prophetically, stay in the flow and respond with the same urgency that the Spirit is speaking over you. Why? Because you're, the measure of your response determines the breadth, the height, the depth, the measure of your victory. And so the man of God rebukes him and says, why didn't you just hit five or six times? And, he's, and the guy's like, oh. He said, you only struck three times. If you would have done five or six times, you would have annihilated your enemy, but now you're just going to defeat him in battles three times. You're not winning the war. Whew. Ow. So if you're like me and you identify with every person in the story, even if your walk is right with the Lord, because <laughs> you're doing soul searching right now, like you just think, wow, it's over like the promise is dead, like the hope for a final victory in the war is just, it's just, it's dead if I'm that person. But look at the grace of God. The Bible says that right after this that Elisha died. And it says that, uh, of course, they put him in a tomb. They did a proper funeral, all of that. It says uh, a little bit later, another person had died and there were these men who were carrying the body to bury the body, right? And they said that these bandits, this gang came in to rob and steal and just destroy stuff right there. And when these guys with the body, I mean, anytime you have a body and you see gangs or bandits, just run, right? Toss the body and run, I'm just saying. In case you ever find yourself in that situation. But so you're carrying a body and all of a sudden you see these gang members come in and you're like, holy snapple, we gotta get out. You know, so you're like, what do we do? What do we do? We gotta hide. How do you hide with a dead body? You know, throw the body, you know? And there was a tomb there and they took the body and they're like chunking. That's what we do in Texas, we chunk. And so we chunk the body and the body goes into the tomb and it just, ready, air quotes, happened to be the tomb of Elisha with dead bones 
you know, dead, over, no muscle, no, no breath, nothing dead. But you know that the promises and the prophecy and the anointing of God never dies. So they take a dead man and they throw him in the tomb of the prophet, which represents Jesus, who is the spirit of prophecy, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. No one can finish the story before he says the story's over. They throw the body in and as soon as the body hits the body, the bones of Elisha, the man gets thrown in like this and he comes up. I wish I had special effects for that. It would blow your mind. What I saw in my head just then, you'd be like, oh, I'm going to the altar right now. It was Avatar-ish. You know, it was like, Shh. y'all get it. I'm blue right now, Shh, right? Okay. The visual people just got that. Others are like, this is a really weird church. We need to, <laughs> they have strange people come and speak here. Listen to this, dead, but not done. Dead, but not done. All the Lord wants from you is that one thing. All he's asking of you today is that one thing. And you said, God, I don't want to go back to that battle. I've fought that battle. I've been beaten up by that battle. I've been defeated by that battle too many times. I'd rather turn around and move out closer to the house of God than go out and be a conqueror. Friend, you can come into this house of God week after week after week after week and never experience the fullness of God if you're not willing to confront your heap of ruins. God intended on that place, not to be a place of defeat for you, but a foundation which you build your authority and your life on. A place upon which that you enjoy the goodness of God, the blessing of God, the prosperity in your spirit from the Lord. Come on, come on, stand up right where you're at. Oh, Jesus, let me tell you one thing. I've had battles that have chased me out of towns. Quite literally, quite literally chased me out of town. I had an incident happen to me when I was in college, right before I I became a Christian, right before I had an encounter with the Lord. And it hurt me so deeply and it marked me and marred me so deeply. It shamed me so deeply. And I was publicly confronted and lied about and it was, it was awful. And it drove me not to God, but away from him. And do you know, until probably 10 years ago, I couldn't even go back to that place. If people would hold meetings in that place, I couldn't go there. I I would just, I would be so torn up. I'd be like, does anyone have a Xanax? You know, I mean, it was that bad. It would just tear me up. It would tear me up. But you know, on April 29th, just a few weeks ago, I walked across the stage in that place. And I received my degree, my master's degree in counseling psychology in that place where I never thought I would even have the courage to set foot on that campus again. And since those days from way long time ago, I won't tell you how long, because then you'll figure out how old I am. But God has consistently brought me back there to preach on that campus consistently. That's my AI. There's way more wrapped up in the story, but I'm not gonna take time, just know. I, 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 I was shattered. I can't, I can't even tell you. Shattered. Decades. Friend, that's not the way God wants you to live. He's God of restoration. And it may look dead to you, but it's not done. But here's the key. 
may have been years that you've done everything but that one thing that God's asked of you. And today, all God wants is that one thing. And he doesn't want it to impose something on you. He exposes it to dispose of it. Why? Because he wants to restore you and make your heap of ruins a foundation for the promises of God. I'm looking out at you today and I, one thing I feel is labels. This is the one word I hear is label, 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 label. And I get it. <laughs> Been there, done that many times. But in the name of the Lord today, I minister freedom to you from the label on your life. That is not who you are. It may have been what you did, but it's not who you are. And the Lord wants you to be free and restored and for you to know yourself in the image of what he created you to be the person he created you to be, the man of God he created you to be. So I speak over your ruins today. And in the name of Jesus, I say live. I say live. I say live. If you can't get there on your own, here's what we're gonna do. We're a team here. I may not be here every Sunday, but I'm a part of this team. Spiritually, I'm a part. And as a team, we're gonna pick up your heap of bones, your broken body, your broken spirit, your broken mind, your broken emotions, and we'll carry you to the tomb of Elisha. Because we know it may be an old promise, but it's a current promise. It, it may look dead, but it ain't done. There's still an anointing in the house. There's still promises of heaven for our generation. And Jesus is responding to you today the same way that he responded to kings who did not serve him and simply wanted to use him. He even extended grace and wrapped his prophetic hands around them to try to transfer something to get them to open their minds to where they're not seeing things, but they're hearing and believing for things. If that's you right now, and you need that anointing to flow and to hit you, you, you feel like you're that dead body, I want you to come up here because listen, God, it may look dead, but God's not done. God wants to resurrect something in you, and God wants to get you over something. The only way you can get over it is to wrap your hands around whatever it is that you haven't been able to get out before and say today, Lord, I surrender all.